In a part of the Nile Valley that was soon going to be flooded by the construction of the Aswan Dam, the archaeologist Fred Wendorf made a groundbreaking discovery. In 1964 he found a prehistoric burial site which contained 61 skeletons near the border between Egypt and Sudan. This burial site, called Jebel Sahaba, was constructed by members of the Qadan culture about 14,000 years ago. Because almost all these skeletons showed clear signs of physical trauma. Wendorf and his colleagues thought they had found the oldest battlefield in history. But were these skeletons really the victims of the first battle? And did organized warfare even exist at all at that time? If so, what did it look like? In this video we address these questions and search for the origins of war. Before that please subscribe to my channel and don't forget to like share and comment. Recently, Isabel Kriebker and her colleagues re-examined the Jebel Sahaba finds. They do not believe the skeletons are the victims of a battle. The dead women, children and men all show signs of fresh and healed injuries. Also, they were not all buried at the same time. This suggests that Jebel Sahaba is not a trace of the first battle in history, but a burial place for the victims of ongoing small acts of violence, i.e. raids, ambushes and the like. The injuries, which were largely caused by arrows and spears, also support this idea. At least two skeletons show that people were struck down and then executed while lying on the ground by an arrow through the lower jaw into the head. In some cases, the skeletons have numerous wounds. In tomb number 44 lies a 30-year-old woman, whose body contained 21 stone splinters from numerous arrowheads. Like many other skeletons, she has a broken forearm, an injury that typically occurs when defending oneself against an impact weapon such as a club. However, the young woman's arm had healed by the time of her death, which suggests that she had been in a fight at least twice in her life. Jebel Sahaba is considered one of the earliest archaeological pieces of evidence of deliberate violence between groups. However, since it probably was a series of smaller clashes over a longer period, the question remains whether these events can be considered war. To get to the bottom of this, we must ask what war is in the first place. Chapter 1. What is war? The archaeologist Andrew K. Shearer defines war as a collective effort involving conflict among autonomous groups involves not only physical trauma but also emotional and psychological trauma. Firstly, this means that war takes place between two separate groups, Secondly a large proportion of these groups are involved in it in some way, and thirdly physical and psychological injuries are caused in the process. Most archaeologists agree with this definition. In the eyes of most military historians, however, it lacks a crucial aspect, namely that of organization. In their eyes a fight is only to be understood as war if several combatants are organized under a leader and operate in a formation and or follow a tactic. For the purposes of this video, we add this point to our definition of war. War is organized. Organization does not mean that there must be big battle ambushes, feuds and small skirmishes can be considered war as well. In terms of size, the fight in the Nile Valley almost 14,000 years ago could potentially be seen as war. However, it is unclear to what extent the clashes were organized and who was involved. Given the age of these finds, a question arises that has been discussed by researchers and philosophers for centuries, namely if war has always existed and it is simply part of human nature. Winston Churchill wrote in his treatise on World War I, the story of humans is war. Except for brief and precarious interludes there has never been peace in the world, and before history began murderous strife was universal and unending. Churchill's view is in the tradition of the political philosopher Thomas Hobbes, who believed that war was in the nature of man and imagined life in a primitive society to be solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Unlike Churchill, for a long time most archaeologists agreed with the view of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who, in response to Hobbes's grim scenario, created the notion of a noble savage, who lived peacefully in harmony with nature. As a result of this, and in the light of the horrors of World War II, many scholars thought of prehistoric warfare as a minor matter. Consequently, they tried to present prehistory as a time of peace and often ignored possible traces of war. Weapons and armor tended to be understood by researchers as status symbols or hunting weapons, and prehistoric fortifications were seen as ritual markers or purely practical devices. One example that still causes great debate today are the walls of Jericho. While some consider them a defensive structure, others, such as the famous Dutch primatologist Franz de Waal, think they were a protection against the spring floods from the nearby mountains. This assumption that war was unimportant in prehistory was only challenged when the influential archaeologist Lawrence H. Keeley published his book, War Before Civilization, The Myth of the Peaceful Savage, in 1996. 
In this book he demonstrates that prehistoric warfare was serious business and neither primitive nor incidental. He emphasizes that conflicts in this period, while small in comparison to modern conflicts such as the Thirty Years' War or the World Wars, had enormous consequences for the hunter-gatherers of prehistory. Primitive warfare is actually total war waged with very limited means. The conflicts of prehistory were mostly short and small, but you must put the whole thing in perspective. For the hunter-gatherer groups of the time, which usually consisted of around 20 to 30 members. Even the loss of a handful of adults could mean a threat to their existence. Keeley's book led archaeologists and historians to reconsider the question of the origins of war. No conclusive answer has been found, and we will not find one here either. It is important, however, not to make the mistake of thinking that there was a peaceful world before history just because no traces of war have survived. Just as those who argue that prehistory was dark and warlike must prove that there was war, those who view it as a lost paradise must prove that there was a peaceful prehistory. Let us search for the first traces of war. Chapter 2. The Beginning of Violence. About 500,000 to 300,000 years ago, humans mastered the use of fire and developed weapons to hunt big games. Groups of hunters could now use spears to kill larger animals such as deer, horses, or woolly mammoths. A famous example of these early weapons is the so-called Shoningen spears, which are between 290,000 and 337,000 years old. Afterwards, hunting methods and weapons became more and more sophisticated. Points and blades made of horn and stone appeared and group cooperation became more complex. By the last ice age, 115,000 to about 11,700 BC, spears, clubs, and thrown stones were the most important weapons. Although there is no clear evidence that the hunter-gatherers of this period also used their weapons against members of the same species, it is very likely that they used all available means when fighting occurred. One of the earliest indications of the use of weapons in conflicts was found in the Schneider Cave in what is now Iraq. Schneider III, a Neanderthal about 45-50,000 years old, has a wound in the chest area that was most likely caused by a throwing spear. Because it had long been assumed that Neanderthals did not use throwing weapons at all and because their physique put them at a disadvantage when throwing spears, researchers assumed that it was a modern human, that is a Homo sapiens, who had thrown the spear. Accordingly, the find was interpreted as a sign of conflict between Neanderthals and early humans. This in turn became an argument in the debate about how modern humans replaced Neanderthals. Indeed, there are two major theories about this. The interbreeding theory, which assumes that humans and Neanderthals interbred, and the replacement theory, which assumes that modern humans forcibly replaced Neanderthals and Denisova humans, possibly even wiping them out in a kind of genocide which could be seen as early signs of war. These possibilities are still discussed today, even in more publicly read books, like Yuval Noah Harari's bestseller Sapiens. According to him, only a small part of the genes of modern humans originated from Neanderthals, which makes it unlikely that they had interbred on a large scale. Harari therefore suspects that humans prevailed in the competition for food thanks to better technology and better social skills, and thus gradually displaced Neanderthals. This suggests that there were conflicts between individual groups, but probably no organized warfare yet, and certainly no coordinated action by humans against the Neanderthals. The two aspects that gave humans an advantage, their use of technology and their social skills, were rapidly evolving. By the late Paleolithic, Paleolithic 35,000 to 12,000 BC, weapons and hunting techniques were becoming more effective, and new weapons such as the atlatl, spear-throwing lever, appeared on the scene. And soon, in the Neolithic, they were increasingly used against members of the same species. Chapter 3. First Traces of War. When Erhard Schock, a wine grower from the small town of Talheim in Baden-Württemberg, Germany, was working in his garden in 1983, he made a gruesome discovery. He came across a pile of human bones. It was not long before archaeologists began digging a pit to get to the bottom of the matter. They discovered the skeletons of 34 men, women, and children, many whom had been killed by a blow to the head. The injury patterns indicate that they had been surprised, executed with a stone axe, and then buried in a pit. This method of execution was also used in two other well-known massacres at Kilianstaten and Schletz and is linked to a whole series of lesser-known acts of violence that took place in Europe around 5000 BC. By means of a so-called isotope analysis, a method that sheds light on what a human or animal ate and therefore hints at a certain habitat, researchers were able to show that the people buried in the Talheim death pit belonged to three groups. Strikingly, 
There were no female corpses among those who lived in Talheim itself, which is why archaeologists assumed that the massacre was related to an abduction of women. However, why the women of the other groups were executed and why so many people of different groups were in one place at the same time remains a mystery. It is also unclear whether these massacres indicate organized warfare between distinct groups. They, however, do indicate that the people of the linear pottery culture in Eastern and Central Europe, which produced many technical, economic, and social innovations, resorted to violence to secure their survival and their interests. The linear pottery culture is considered the oldest culture in Central Europe that had permanent settlements in the Neolithic. They are most famous for their long houses. The shift from hunting and gathering to a sedentary lifestyle is part of a vital change in human history called the Neolithic Revolution. People began to settle down, cultivate crops and raise livestock. This not only led to greater population density, but also intensified conflicts over resources. People built up stocks from the surpluses they produced, but that also meant they had more to lose. Their supplies provided a worthwhile target for those who had not yet settled in other raiders, which, according to the historian Kashik Roy, led to increased fighting between groups. Along with territorial and personal disputes, the struggle for resources was the most common trigger of conflict throughout Eurasia. To protect themselves and their supplies and possessions, settled groups soon began to fortify their settlements. We will continue with this topic please be sure to subscribe and press the bell icon so don't miss any update. See you soon. Thanks for watching.